All right, uh, 12.30. Uh, so, because we have the homework driving us, basically, telling us that uh, we need to do certain things, uh, what I have done is I merged, uh, I think, like five lectures in uh, these slides, and most probably we need the whole week to cover them. I don't really want to run. Uh, and if somehow we understand the subject area with these slides, I'm not going to give any extra lectures on this topic. If not, we will come back and I will... Uh, so there is a lot of little things that I don't have in the slides, right? We have only the big picture. But if you understand what I'm talking uh, this week, then we will not need to, to go further. So uh, we will uh, start talking about Bayesian statistics today. So really, we haven't said anything about Bayesian statistics yet. So. I will define things like prior, posterior, predictive distributions, and and, um, and then the rest is examples. Okay, uh, some of the examples uh, will be trivial. Some of the examples will be very complicated. Uh, but remember, nothing is complicated because everything comes from Bayes' rule, and the rest is algebra. We like it or not. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, I don't want you know you will be reading all the slides, right? So let me uh, start by saying that the discussion, basically in this lecture and the following uh, several lectures, actually if not the whole course, is going to be about parametric modeling. So what does that mean? It means that uh, we have a model, and the model has uh, a number of uh, parameters that somehow we want to compute. Uh, using some limited data, okay? And uh, and when I say a model, the model can be a distribution like a Gaussian from where you take samples but you don't know the mean or the variance, or it can be some very complicated computer code. And actually, long term, that's what I want you to think, that the model is a computer code that if you give the input, you get the output, but it involves a number of parameters, theta, that you don't really know what to put there, okay? And uh, so the idea would be using some observations of x, and uh, this model f of x given theta, somehow we're going to try to calculate the parameters uh, theta. So this function f of x uh, that gives us uh, basically from where the data uh, are coming from uh, is called the likelihood, okay? So if this is, let's say a Gaussian model and theta are the mean and the variance, so uh, that Gaussian model is our likelihood function, okay? I will elaborate what the word function means, but the word likelihood means it's something that tells you the uh, likelihood of observing the data that you have at hand, okay? So it's the probability basically of the observations, but uh, we will change the interpretation shortly to, to make this better and define it as a function of theta rather than as a probability. All right, so uh, we have uh, a model. The model has some unknown parameters, and uh, this is what we call a parametric model. So you notice this notation here is very important, right? So if you have a model, you think of this as a model from where you get samples of x if you knew the parameters. But once you do this, once you have collected some data, we look at this function as a function of theta, of the parameters, okay? Uh, and as a function of the parameters, this is not a distribution in the parameters. As a matter of fact, in many occasions, you will not even be able to normalize this. So again, you can think of this being, let's say, likelihood from where, uh, the likelihood of the Gaussian model from where you sample data, but once you calculate this, you look at it in a reverse order, you look at this as a function of the parameters theta given the data x, okay? Uh, all right, so this is what we call the likelihood function. So uh, as an example, and uh, you can think of uh, millions of uh, different types of examples in your own uh, uh, work, uh, this is a probability, for example, that uh, tells you 
the probability of forest fires. And uh, this probability is a logistic model. We will discuss those later on in the course. But basically think that you are setting a model that says the probability of fires is this nice function. And you have a few factors here that include things like uh, humidity rate, temperature, uh, the degree of management of the forest, etc. But there is a bunch of parameters, say one, a two, a three. So uh, a parametric. So this is a parametric model, all right. And eventually, our objective in this lecture today will be somehow to be able, from some observations of when fires take place, to compute these parameters alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three. Okay. Now. What is new about Bayesian statistics, right, that we will elaborate today, everything that we don't know, we're going to make it a random variable. OK? Everything we don't know, we're going to make it a random variable. So we're not going to go and compute some numbers for alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. We're going to consider them as random variables. And given some observations, we're going to compute the posterior of these uh, variables. That's the Bayesian setting. OK? As a matter of fact, you will see later on, um, if alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, let's say, are random variables, uh, and we express those in some parametric form, they will have their own unknown parameters in those new forms. So if alpha 1 is Gaussian, obviously we have some unknown mean and some unknown variance. And then you want to push it, that unknown mean will have another distribution in a hierarchical fashion. So basically, anything you don't know, you keep making it a random variable, hoping that at the end of the day, you will find uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, representation of the reality. All right, so let me uh, introduce uh, what is called the sufficiency principle, OK? Nothing Bayesian yet. And rather than uh, starting with the definition of what the sufficiency principle is, let me do this with an example, and then we will go backwards on the slide. So let's say that we have a collection of data, x1, x2, xn, that are IID data from some Gaussian with some unknown uh, mean and variance. So I call those parameters theta. OK? Uh, again, a univariate Gaussian. And somehow we s have some samples, x1, x2, xn, OK, uh, that we draw independently from this Gaussian. OK? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down uh, the, pro the likelihood of the data, all right? And so uh, this is the calculation that you see here. So uh, because the data are IID, will you agree with me that the likelihood is, the likelihood, you remember, when you write it, first you think the parameters are fixed. So the data are independent given the parameters. So will you agree with me that the likelihood is basically the product of these Gaussians for each xj, okay? So that's the product. This is the definition of the Gaussian for each xj. Okay. Uh, I have a product of exponentials, so I can put this inside, and I get a summation. All right. Uh, on the denominator, sigma is uh, um, this is really sigma is outside the square there. Yes. All right, so this you can write this as 2 pi sigma square. Sigma square is theta 2, and you have uh, n of those, so you have an n over 2 factor here. You see that? Okay, and uh, sigma square is theta 2, and I am expanding uh, the summation here, so I'm going to have summation of xj squares uh, minus 2 times theta 1 summations of xj. All right, and then I have uh, this term squared with a minus sign there. So the likelihood looks like that. Nothing fancy, OK? Now, what is important to notice, when we started the problem, we said we have a collection of data x1, x2, xn. But now, when you look at the likelihood, uh, you realize that you don't really need to know each of these data points separately when it comes to likelihood, the only thing you need to know is the summation of the xj's and the summation of xj squares. OK? Notice there is no any other term that involves the axis alone. All right? So 
I already had uh, discussed this in passing, right? We call the summation of xj and the summation of xj squared the sufficient statistics. All right? And the word the sufficient statistics implies in a non-Bayesian way that these are the only quantities we will need to compute theta. Okay? There is no x is coming alone, right? It's only this summation and that summation, nothing else. Okay? So, let's go back to uh, x drawn from this uh, distribution with some parameters theta. So, the definition says a function t of x. So, for example, in our case, t will be the sum here or the sum squares of the data x. So, this is all the data x. Uh, is called a statistic of x. And we say it to be sufficient if the distribution of uh, uh, x conditional upon t of x is independent of theta. I don't know why I put little x's there and capital x's, right? So the way that I have it here, I should put capital x's everywhere. So we call t to be sufficient statistic of the distribution if the distribution of x conditional upon t of x is independent of theta. Now, this equation here uh, gives me an expression of this sufficiency principle for the likelihood model. So let me discuss it a little bit, and then I will prove it. Okay? So you notice here I separate this in two terms. And the first term is the only term that uh, there is dependency on theta. And in the first term, the data are only coming in the form of the sufficient statistics, t of x. So you don't get any of the data points separately along, right? Only here you have the sufficient statistics, t of x. And then there is another term uh, that is, let's say, some function of x given the sufficient statistics. And if you notice in this expression here, there is no such a term. It's a constant, basically. x doesn't come anywhere else. So you can think of this equation, right, that the only dependence on theta comes through the sufficient statistics. If you want to see a proof of this equation, it's very simple. So what I do is, um, uh, by the way, on this slide and many other slides, it doesn't matter if you see here a symbol f or a g or etc. Treat all of this as probabilities. All right? Treat all of this as probabilities. It is normal in the literature to, sim to use the symbol f for the likelihood, but it's really a probability model, okay? So we're going to be using probability laws, even though you don't see a p there, okay? So here's the likelihood. Uh, I'm going to, the first uh, equation that you see here, it says f of x given theta is the same as f of x comma t of x given theta. I mean, if I have x here, I can put any function of x, nothing changes, because x has everything on it. Okay, so I write this as a probability of x comma t of x given theta, and then I use basically uh, the product rule, and I say, so look at this theta, okay, so forget the theta for a moment. I can write this as the conditional probability of x given tx times the probability of tx. Can you see that? This is the probability of x given tx times the probability of tx. And According to the sufficiency principle, it says that x, all right, uh, the conditional distribution of x given tx is independent of theta. So really, this g distribution, the way you see it there, is equal to that. And this is what you see there. OK? What I want you to remember, basically, here, OK, uh, is that the dependence on theta comes only through t of x. And we call t of x the sufficient statistics. OK? There is a graphical uh, model representation of this, but I will not bother since uh, really uh, it would take us 10 minutes to uh, explain this probabilistic graphical model sort of uh, uh, visualization of this uh, independence relation. All right. So these are the sufficient statistics. And of course, you know, if you want to write them in a nicer form, 
uh, this, uh, if you want to divide this by n, you get basically uh, the sample mean, all right? Lots of times, instead of using the summation of xj squared, you use uh, the summation of xj minus the sample mean squared, okay? And if you want to redefine basically the likelihood in terms of uh, x bar and s squared, simple algebra, you just rearrange these terms and you write them in terms of x bar and s squared, you get something like that, okay? So the sufficient statistics here is s, uh, and uh, x bar, I mean s squared and x bar. All right. Uh, let's do one example of the sufficiency principle, right? We said uh, that the only dependence on the parameters comes through the sufficient statistics. So I know this is on a slide that is coming up uh, one or two slides from now. But do you remember what's the idea of the maximum likelihood estimator? We already saw some examples in an earlier lecture. So if somebody asks you, find me the parameters theta given uh, the sufficient statistics, what is the maximum likelihood estimator? We will formally see it in a slide, but what is the maximum likelihood estimator? Not the answer, but the process. This is the likelihood, right? So you remember, we're going to see the likelihood as a function of theta once we write it down. And the maximum likelihood estimator gives me theta by, what's the idea? The theta that does what? That maximizes the likelihood, OK? So let's suppose we know this even though we don't, because I haven't really done it formally. So I wanted to check the following with you. Does the maximum likelihood estimator of the parameters theta satisfies the sufficiency principle? In other ways, if I have two collections of data sets that, um, uh, you know, so in this case, I'm taking the, the, the variance is constant, so we don't have to deal with it, right? So let's say uh, we have two data sets that I denote x and x prime, and these data sets are such that the summation of xj's is the same as the summation of xj prime. So you collect data, right, x1 to xn, and then another collection of x1 prime, x1 prime, and these two data sets have the same sample mean. So what I'm asking you, does the MLE estimate satisfy the sufficiency principle? The sufficiency principle says that the parameters theta only depend on the sufficient statistic. Mm -hmm. So if I have two data sets that make the summations of xj to be the same, is the MLE estimate basically satisfying the sufficiency principle? Why not? The MLE estimate, all right, so here we take that the variance is constant, okay? So S is not an issue. The only dependence here, all right, in theta comes through X bar. And we said we will take the two X bars to be the same. Mm -hmm. So this will give you exactly the same estimates of the parameters. Mm -hmm. So the MLE estimate satisfies basically the sufficiency principle. Mm -hmm. Okay? But however, Let's do another weird problem, and let's take uh, as an estimate of the mean, right? This is what we're looking here, right? So we take the variance to be constant. Let's take as an estimate of the mean uh, to be uh, not the MLE estimate, which is the sample mean, but if you take a sequence of data, the first data point, that's your estimate of mu. A very weird estimate. Will this satisfy the sufficiency principle? So you collect a bunch of data, take the first element, you say, that's my mean. Take another data set, take the first element, that's my mean. Does this satisfy the sufficiency principle? No, because if the two points, x1 and x1 prime, are not the same, uh, obviously the predictions of the parameters of the mean here will be different. Mm -hmm. OK? So, the sufficiency principle and the likelihood, uh, uh, 
idea are going hand to hand basically because the likelihood principle automatically satisfies uh, this efficiency principle. Okay? Effectively, the likelihood principle that we will see shortly, right, it tells you that the parameters theta are maximizing this function here. And obviously, you can see uh, this function is uh, defined completely by the sufficient statistics. So if you have two data sets with the same values of the sufficient statistics, you will get the same estimate of the parameters theta. Nothing Bayesian uh, up to now, OK? So um, I see another typo there. So let me uh, uh, define uh, the likelihood principle. So in the inference about theta, the information brought by an observation is entirely contained in the likelihood function, OK? So uh, everything we have is the likelihood function, OK? So when we try to compute uh, the parameters, nothing else is available but the likelihood function. And uh, the maximum likelihood principle is basically computing the parameters theta that uh, maximize the likelihood. And you can see immediately see if you have two likelihoods that they are uh, proportional by a factor here that does not depend on theta, basically they give you the same estimate of the parameters theta. So if you have two likelihoods, if you have two models that they vary by some function of x, which is not function of theta, you still get the same answers. All right? So two completely different models. If uh, L1 and L2 for theta comes uh, are the likelihood models uh, you know, times some factor which is a function of x, basically they both give you the same uh, estimator for the parameters theta. All right, so this is uh, uh, formally the maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, you look at the likelihood as a function of the parameters. So once you look at this as a function of the parameters, this is not any more probability. It's not normalizable or anything like that. But if you can treat as a function, you can take the maximum uh, of that function, and the argument will give you the MLE estimate of the parameters. Uh, and, um, uh, and that's it. Nicholas? Yep? Sorry. Uh, we haven't seen the, the notation with R. That just means the argument. Uh, yeah. Just, I, we haven't seen that. I haven't seen that. Yes. So uh, basically here is, right? You are you are maximizing this with respect to the parameter theta, and that's what you return. That's the MLE estimate. What's the difference between the arg max and the arg sup? And the arg sup? It, it's uh, uh, too technical. It's just you, uh, for all practical purposes, you're taking the maximum value. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we'll leave it there. Okay. okay. So is there any But if you write me your homework arg sup, you know you get an extra point. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> What is the difference between maximum and uh, I said that I already responded. It's, it's not important. Oh, okay. Okay? Okay, okay. All right. If you want really to know, uh, stop by and I will let you know. <laughs> it will make no difference in our course. Okay? All right. Um, all right. So let me uh, start doing examples, right? This is what we have from now on. So uh, let's work on the uh, maximum uh, likelihood estimator for the Gaussian. Okay? So we're, you know, we already did this, but I want to formally see what type of answers uh, we get when we perform the maximization process. So we have a univariate Gaussian. We collect a bunch of uh, n data points. All right, so the likelihood function looks like that. Once we write it, we're going to treat it as a function of mu and sigma square. All right, and uh, uh, so we're going to, you can see now there's no, I just put the maximum for you there. So you don't ask me the same question. Uh, so we're going to uh, explicitly, uh, uh, if you look, OK, uh, if you look here, right, this involves an exponential, OK? And uh, this is sort of uh, a little bit awkward to work with, OK? So lots of times, if you try to maximize this, you are better off if you maximize the log of that. Okay, so if you see one or the other, uh, for example, here I explicitly say we're going to maximize the log likelihood. All right, I mean actually, I do not know any problem where you will actually maximize directly the likelihood function. You will do this with the log uh, likelihood. So basically, this is what I have here: the log likelihood. Uh, 
And uh, this comes from the exponential of the Gaussian. This comes, the two terms, they come from the normalization. And uh, so when you take derivatives with respect to mu equal to zero, with respect to sigma squared equal to zero, these are the answers you get in one line of calculation. All right, so these results now, they, we haven't really we have talked on uh, these results because they come all over the space, you know, and in all the lectures, but now we see them that these are the MLE estimates. So the MLE estimate of the mean is the sample mean, and the MLE estimate of the variance is the sample variance, uh, and pay attention, uh, this is the variance where the mean, it is the sample mean. It's very important. Because obviously, uh, uh, this is not a correct result, right? Because you don't know the exact mean. Um, so this is the sample, uh, the sample mean. All right. Um, so uh, if you look at these equations, right? Look at the right hand side. It contains x and xi squared. X are samples from a Gaussian. So they are really random variables following that underlying variable, I mean, that underlying uh, Gaussian. So it makes sense to actually ask, what is the expectation of the MLE estimate for mu, and what's the expectation for the MLE estimate for sigma squared? At least as a non-Bayesian person, since I haven't said anything about Bayesian yet, right? I will ask, what is the expectation of this, and what's the expectation of that? And uh, so, if you actually uh, take the expectation of this, these are independent random variables, right? The only thing you need in the calculation, and it's in the slides, you need two types of uh, formulas here. Uh, the expectation of xi squared is sigma squared plus mu squared. From where is this coming? You remember the variance, what is it? The expectation of x squared minus the expectation of x yes. squared. Yes. This is xi squared, right? Yes. And then the expectation of xi xj is mu squared. If i different from j, from where is that coming? What leads to this result? Cor 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 what is the assumption to, be to get this? That xi and xj is their iid. They're independent of each other. Okay, so literally, <laughs> this is what you need, that the expectation of xi xj for i different than j is mu squared, the expectation of xi squared sigma squared plus mu squared. So what you really need to do when you take expectation of this, expand the squares there and take it, you know, um, expectations, and these are the answers that you're getting. And why do we really care? Because we see that the expectation of the MLE estimate for mu is what we call it's an unbiased estimate. Unbiased. And the idea is the expectation of the MLE estimate is actually the true, uh, the true mean of the distribution. But we see that the expectation of the sample variance, it is not actually the true variance. Can you repeat why is that again? Uh, so the definition of unbiased, right, means that the expectation of these estimates are the two parameters of the distribution. Okay. okay, so the mean comes to be correct, unbiased, but the variance varies from the true variance, which is sigma squared, by this factor n minus one over n. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, generally speaking, if n is big, this makes no difference, and you say, ah, oh, this is unbiased, but if you have very few data, uh, you can get yourself in trouble, okay? So, uh, so this is unbiased, this is biased, and a way to, uh, to correct actually this thing for the, uh, if I see the formula, a way to correct uh, the uh, estimator for the uh, variance is instead of using the sample variance, to use one over n minus one of this, Right, and if you repeat the calculations, you will see that this estimate is indeed unbiased. I mean, you can see, right, if you um, uh, if you multiply this n minus one uh, and n minus one, right, this is what I have here, okay, and if you repeat the calculations, you will immediately see that the expectation of this estimate 
is actually sigma squared. Okay? So you may say uh, 1 over n, 1 over n minus 1. If n is 100, this makes no difference, right? But again, for small n, uh, it does make a difference. Actually, um, in my longer version of this uh, slides, I have an extremely nice uh, 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 pictorial that shows how you can go wrong with two data points in estimating uh, a Gaussian. Okay? Uh, and so I'm going to bring this picture on a forthcoming lecture so that you can convince yourselves how important this can be. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, when we become Bayesians, all right, uh, and uh, we take mu and sigma squared to be random variables, somehow this calculation here comes directly in a Bayesian setting. So a Bayesian setting uh, in which actually we will integrate uh, mu out from the joint posterior, you will see you can actually get an estimate that looks exactly like this uh, without having to post-process and do a new definition of what your estimate of sigma squared is. Okay? We will see this later on. Um, so the statisticians basically say that this one here is subtracting one degree of freedom, they say, has been used to fit uh, the sample mean, and that's why you subtract this thing here. Okay? Uh, uh, actually, in, in, uh, in a lecture when we do regression models, you will see formulas like that, but instead of having 1 divided by n minus 1, it will be 1 n minus some other number that will have a similar significance. Okay? So obviously there is something there for us to, uh, to consider. Let's make life a little bit more difficult, not substantially. We're going to extend these results to a multivariate Gaussian. Now, one of the things that I really strongly encourage you is to become very familiar with sort of all type of manipulations of Gaussians. Okay? Uh, the, the calculations, they are not complicated, but maybe the first time you see them, you say, wow, this is uh, not for me. Okay? So uh, what I do here is I take uh, the log likelihood for a multivariate Gaussian. These two terms are the, uh, coming from the normalization terms. This is the determinant of the covariance. And this is the exponential, the square exponential. OK? All right? Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take derivatives with respect to the mean mu and derivatives with respect to the covariance sigma and set those derivatives equal to 0. Now, you may say, wait a second, you're going to take a derivative with respect to a vector and a derivative with respect to a matrix? Yes. Is that allowed? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, everything is allowed, OK? But I don't have time to define it. So if you have questions, please come to see me. This is very, you remember when we were talking about actually uh, where this thing came? When we're talking about uh, uh, these variational methods where we're taking derivatives with respect to a distribution, I told you, take p and p plus delta p. So in essence, that idea can be extended here as well. So if you want, let's say, to take derivatives with respect to sigma, sort of the calculation that comes at the end is like writing this equation uh, once more for sigma plus delta sigma, subtracting the two equations, and take that linear term in delta sigma to be 0. That would be the derivative. OK? But I will give you the answers, actually. But effectively, there is uh, a logical way to define derivatives with respect to vectors and, and uh, matrices. So if you do that, uh, the answer comes that the mean is uh, the sample mean, uh, no surprise. And uh, it comes out that the variance is the sample variance exactly as before. Uh, where again here we have the MLE estimate. So nothing uh, surprising. Uh, there is one um, sort of quiet uh, uh, mistake that I'm doing here, but I'm lucky that the result uh, takes care of that mistake. The mistake that I'm doing is when I take derivatives with respect to sigma, okay, uh, I nowhere constrain this for sigma to be symmetric. And positive definite. 
But actually, by a miracle, the answer comes to be symmetric and positive. Definitely, so it's all good. Right? So basically, this could have been a major trouble. Right? Because nowhere in the optimization problem we enforce the, the covariance has to be symmetric. All right. Uh, the derivations basically uh, are given here, all, everything you need to know. And uh, I'm going to say only two things, OK? These are the two results that you need to understand, OK? Uh, if, uh, you ha so the first result is if you have derivative with respect to a matrix of the log of the determinant of a matrix, this is A minus transpose, OK? And we need this. So this is a fundamental result. And if you need, if you have the trace of the product of two matrices, you know what's the trace of a matrix? The, the sum of the diagonals. So if you have the trace of AB and you take derivatives with respect to A, it's B transpose. And something else that's extremely fundamental when you write equations with this square exponential, you know, remember the trace of A and B is the same as trace of B and A. So you can change the order, the trace doesn't change. And why is that important? Because in the calculations uh, that involve this, um, uh, you know, this quadratic term, notice what I have done is, I, I, I want you to look actually, look at this, forget the derivative, okay? The derivatives, I'm not gonna show it. Look at this summation of the square exponential and look how I'm writing it and tell me from where do I get that. It says this trace is the same with that. And tell me where is that coming from? The simplicity of the trace. What type of quantity is the summation? Is it scalar, vector, what is it? Scalar. This whole summation in the, you know, in, um, this is, our Mahana lobby's distance, in case you forgot, okay? So what type of quantity is this whole summation? Scalar. It's scalar. So the trace of a scalar, isn't it the same as the scalar? So actually, I can write this trace of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. The trace of a scalar is, is the scalar, okay? So this whole thing, I can write trace. And then inside the trace, you remember trace of A, B is the same, trace of B, A. What have I done? I took this and I put it on the front, mm -hmm. and then I again I took sigma minus one and I put it on the front, mm -hmm. and then this becomes the trace of sigma minus one times this summation. For this is what is called the scatter uh, data matrix that comes all over the place when you play with uh, with Gaussians. Okay, uh, again, uh, this is an extremely important trick with this term, right? You write this as the trace of this quantity because it's scalar. And then you start moving terms uh, from uh, the extreme right to the left, right? And if you do this twice, this is what you get. And so I, what I'm doing is I'm using these identities when I take derivatives. And another trick I do, just to make uh, the whole derivation in one slide, Instead of taking derivatives with respect to sigma and setting them equal to zero, I take derivatives with respect to sigma inverse. Because the alpha is simpler. Okay? You can, it will not make any difference. You can take derivatives with respect to sigma, but this is what I do. All right. And um, uh, again, if you want uh, to know the proof of those two identities, I give them on this uh, slide. And they actually use very elementary sort of type of. Uh, uh, algebra to do the derivation. Uh, so I mentioned to you a rigorous way of uh, doing this, but uh, actually with matrices, I see here, you can uh, do this component-wise and then generalize from components uh, to matrices. So you know, if you want the derivative of the log of the determinant of A, define the derivative with respect to each of the components of the matrix, and then basically put all of this together to get another matrix. I am going to be using these identities very often, okay? So uh, please, uh, uh, please take a look and, and uh, 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 you know, so we know what, uh, when we see them again. All right, um, uh, different ways of uh, rewriting the MLE estimate, okay? So if you expand this, you may see this written 
and I may also be using it on, uh, on a uh, follow-up uh, slide. Uh, the sample uh, variance is basically 1 over n, x, n, x, n transpose, and this is minus the sample mean, sample mean transpose. Remember, vector, vector, transpose, you get uh, a matrix, all right? So the order of the transpose here is very important. You notice this is x, x transpose. That's how you get a matrix. If it goes x transpose x, you get scalar. Mm -hmm. All right. And if you want to make uh, the estimate of the, the MLE estimate for sigma unbiased, basically instead of 1 over n, again, you can plug in a 1 over n minus 1, and then the expectation of this comes to be the true covariance of the distribution. And again, the only thing you need to prove all of these things is the same identities that I showed you for the univariate case. So, you know, uh, and actually, I am putting both of those identities in one equation using the delta function there. All right, uh, we're ready to start talking about Bayesian things. So we, we are trying to, my microphone was off, so who knows what uh, uh, has been played. Uh, someone needs to be in charge of my microphone in my head and say, is your microphone on? All right. Now this makes my day. All right. So uh, we want to estimate the parameters theta, OK? And um, um, so what we started with in a non-basic way, we had the likelihood all right, uh, of uh, in a set of observations uh, that we used to evaluate this. And uh, so what we're going to do is what is going to be different on a, on a Bayesian setting. The parameters theta that we want to estimate, we will stop looking for a point estimate, like the way we did with maximum likelihood estimation. And we will look uh, for parameters theta that they are random variables. Right? So we're going to say, no, we don't want point estimates. We're going to assume they are random variables. And we're going to compute their whole distribution after we collect data. Right? We collect some data. Now we say, uh, can you compute uh, the distribution of the parameters? And somewhere in between, uh, because we're going to make these random variables random, we're going to assume what is called a prior model for uh, these parameters. So we're going to make sort of a probabilistic assumption uh, as to the, what type of distribution we expect to see for these random variables. Now, if we don't have any knowledge, you say, take something that's literally uninformative. Take it a uniform distribution uh, from minus infinity to infinity, where everything is possible. OK? The Bayesian statisticians, actually, they don't say, oh, use something that's very uninformative. If you have knowledge, you use it. OK? If you have knowledge, you use it. All right. Um, you remember this example. I am not going to repeat it, OK? Uh, we had discussed this case with a medical exam, all right, where, uh, you know, we knew the probabilities of uh, a medical exam to, be, uh, to come positive or negative for somebody who has the disease and somebody who doesn't have the disease. And we postulated, the, we said the following question, if you take the exam and it's positive, what is the chance that you're actually sick, okay? And what we did is, uh, we use uh, a combination of the product and sum rules to invert the probabilities and compute the probability that you have the disease if the test came positive. You remember that? So what I want is, I want to start with a simple example and generalize this uh, problem, uh, uh, you know, to formally introduce what the Bayesian setting is, okay? So, uh, so obviously, in this medical exam problem, we have data. For example, what's the data is you took the test, and the test was positive. That's the data you had. And then you had a hypothesis and that you wanted to test. And the hypothesis here is, do you have the disease? OK? Now, uh, we also had a prior model because we know what percentage of the population has the disease, right? So if we take 10,000 people, we know how often people, you know, 
what's the percentage of the people that have this uh, disease. And what we want to do is, uh, after introducing a prior on our hypothesis, in our case, this comes from population statistics, uh, and uh, having a likelihood model, all right, uh, we wanted to calculate the posterior of our hypothesis given the data x, okay? And I'm writing the Vegas rule in, uh, in a very general form here, where the posterior of the hypothesis h given x is the likelihood times the prior of h divided by normalization factor uh, m of x. The notation looks very strange and very new to all of you. So what I suggest is take every symbol that is here and call it P, probability. OK? Uh, somehow, uh, people like to, you know, to use, and I mentioned this, to use pi for probabilities, f for the likelihood model, and m for the, uh, um, the, this uh, uh, marginalization factor. Right? I mean, this is not really a probability, the m of x, the way we have it. And uh, so this is the posterior, this is the likelihood, this is the prior, uh, divided by basically uh, the integral of this over h. OK, I'm going to show you this explicitly in, uh, in a forthcoming slide. So basically, what you see here is nothing else but the application of this uh, product and some rules of probability but we give a Bayesian interpretation here in the sense that this hypothesis, or you can think these are the parameters we try to estimate, we postulate some prior model of this. What does prior mean? Prior is a model that we postulate for H before we see any data. Right? Before we see any data, we say, oh, this distribution is Gaussian. Okay? This is our model, this is our mathematical model, this is our likelihood of the observation sex given the parameters or hypothesis age. And this is now inversion of probabilities that gives us the posterior of the hypothesis age, let's say, being true, or the posterior of the parameters given the observation sex. Okay? Uh, so we went from playing completely with the likelihood and computing point estimates of parameters to actually computing uh, the posterior uh, of the parameters uh, through Vegas rule. All right. Uh, now, uh, obviously, in a lot of uh, settings in, uh, in classical uh, statistics, there is no such a thing as a prior model. This is Bayesian, all right? This is Bayesian. So if you have, let's say, uh, a very complicated uh, system, uh, let's say you have a, a system and one of your parameters is the radius of the Earth, right? And uh, you can actually go and say the radius of the Earth is a random variable. And people say, you must be kidding, what does that mean? So when I make the radius of the Earth a random variable, it means, yeah, but you know, that guy measured it and, uh, and the other guy measured it and they differ plus minus this, so really nobody's completely certain. So you put some prior on that, even though the radius of the Earth is deterministic. OK? The idea here is we treat everything as a random variable because it expresses our uh, confidence on these estimates, on these parameters, right? It's a there, these are belief probabilities. OK? It's a philosophical thing, but basically you say, you know what? I am not confident on that value that I read in that paper because another paper had plus minus that. So you make basically you say, look, I'm going to make it a uniform variable, let's say, from here to there. Okay? So it doesn't again mean that in reality there's no such a thing as one parameter theta. There may be, but basically you have no idea what that is, and the way we're going to compute it is by making it uh, a random variable. So obviously. Uh, the subject area, the Bayesian statistics, is completely uh, subjective because you can put a prior model which may be different from mine, and uh, and uh, you know so um, and we will get different results, right? So people criticize Bayesian statistics, saying, "Oh, you know, you can get garbage in, garbage out." Uh, 
but even those people now have switched completely to Bayesian statistics. Okay? So, uh, so let's not philosophize further. That's our likelihood model. Uh, this is really like, you know, our samples come from a Gaussian, the parameters theta, uh, let's say, are the parameters in the Gaussian, or this can be a, you know, a climate uh, model where uh, you have 20, 30, 40, 50 parameters that you don't know how to calibrate them. People set them historically with some values, uh, but really you have no confidence on any of them. Uh, all right, so that's your likelihood model. So the idea here is, you know the probability of observations, like temperature, humidity, you know, et cetera, if you knew those parameters, okay? And, um, uh, and then uh, these, you do probabilistic inference and you compute the posterior of the parameters if once you have some observations x, okay? So again, you set the prior for the parameters, you compute the likelihood of the observations that you have at hand, okay? And uh, from those two, you can compute what is called the posterior. Uh, posterior again, posterior means after you collect the data, uh, this is what you believe uh, the distribution for the parameters theta is all about. The normalization factor uh, is basically you can think uh, nothing else but the integral of the numerator so that this comes to be uh, as a distribution it integrates to one so m of x is the product uh, it's an integral in theta of the likelihood times the prior d theta I want you to actually remember this because in most relevant Bayesian calculations uh, uh, we will need to involve this normalization factor so when you do Monte Carlo methods, and we will spend weeks on this, you don't really care at all about this. You only need the numerator. But when you say, I want to compare this model with that model, you know, it's all about this normalization factor. Okay? And I'm going to start doing some calculations on this uh, on Thursday. So I want to early on tell you uh, that this is very important. Okay? Very important. So let's say you, uh, you uh, compute the posterior, um, and you don't really care about the whole distribution, but you want something like a point estimate, the way that we had a point estimate with, uh, with maximum likelihood. Is there any such point estimate uh, in, in, uh, in a Bayesian setting? And the answer is yes. And that estimate is called the maximum posteriori estimate. So uh, it's the theta that does what? It maximizes the posterior. So basically, and again, we're working with uh, uh, logs, OK? So it's the theta that maximizes the log of the posterior. And because the posterior is really uh, the product of, uh, you see, I should put an F there, right? So another typo. So is the, the uh, summation of the logs of the likelihood and the log of the prior, all right? And you notice, uh, if you think of this as an optimization problem, think that this problem, maximizing, like doing an MLE estimate, think of it that is a nasty optimization problem that if you have only a few data, you will not be able to do it correctly. So this log of P of theta, what it does is, it regularizes the optimization problem. It makes it well posed. Okay, so basically, in cases with few data, doing MLE, uh, it will not give you sensible answers, but adding this extra term to define this map estimate will give you uh, a much better uh, 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 estimate of theta. So a point estimate will be to find the theta that maximizes the posterior, and uh, this is what it is. Uh, the bad news is if you uh, compute if you do calculations using the map estimate, you're not really Bayesian yet. I'm going to tell you when you're truly Bayesian. But there are uh, lots of people in machine learning that want very quick answers that are extremely happy in just computing this. OK, lots of people, all right? But uh, don't say, I'm Bayesian. You're not Bayesian, OK? You are semi-Bayesian. All right, uh, you can also compute the posterior mean uh, and other point estimates. So if you want, you can compute the mean of the posterior distribution. 
And again, I'm using here the definition of the mean. And you remember, we talk about conditional means. So this is the posterior of theta given your data x. So you denote it like that. And also, you can uh, compute uh, posterior quantile. So you can say, what's the probability that theta is greater than some value? And that's nothing else but integrating the posterior from uh, A to infinity. OK? Um, by the way, a lot of these problems, uh, if not all, can be solved with Monte Carlo methods, right? So we will, uh, uh, obviously, there is a need to learn more about Monte Carlo. OK, uh, now I'm going to make it a little bit more difficult. So you, you know, uh, you know. So you have a model, right? You have some parameters. You put a prior. You get a posterior. Um, but something I want you to realize is, nobody cares about parameters. If you, you know, if you take a climate model, right? And, and we had a visitor, I think, last year, who gave a presentation and told us there's 34 parameters, and you ask him. What are those parameters? He says, I don't know. They introduced them in 1965 and 1973, and this guy is dead now, but you have to calibrate these parameters. Mess, OK? Nobody cares about parameters. You know what you care in a Bayesian setting? So you collect some data. Let's say these are climate data, temperatures. You know, You would like to know what the future is. You would like to know, uh, you know, uh, what your next, you know, your next observation will look like. So you want to, to be able to do predictions, and uh, and that's when you become Bayesian. So here is the cal the calculation for uh, doing predictions. Uh, I'm going to give you first the answer, so then we will see that the derivation is very simple. Suppose you have a model that has parameters that we don't really care in essence. You collected some data x, you compute the posterior, and now you want to find what is your next, what's the probability of your next observation, x hat. So x hat is your future. You don't have observations of that. You only have observations of x that you use to calculate the posterior of the parameters. So here is how this answer for this probability looks like. I'm going to give you only the answer. So this is the predictive distribution. So the predictive distribution is an integral in parameter space of, what is this? This is the likelihood of your future observation times the posterior. The posterior is computed with the data that you already have. And this is the likelihood of the future observations. And you remember the likelihood is only a function of, yeah. of theta. It doesn't depend on x, right? The likelihood is only a function of theta. So effectively, when do you become Bayesian? When you do this integration where you average in the parameter space. So effectively, this is a new way of thinking of problems, right? When you try to do predictions, you don't use one model with one value of the parameters. You say, for these values, this is my answer. You say, you know what? I don't trust any of these parameters. I'm going to take all possible models for all possible values of the parameters that come from the posterior and average over all possible models. This is a Bayesian model averaging. You're going to take all these models and average them to be able to do predictions. OK? Uh, so when you actually do this integral rigorously, all right? Uh, then you become a Bayesian. Now, if this integral, uh, you go and you put there a delta function that is around the map estimate, then effectively you get a point estimate. Um, you know, then it's like evaluating your likelihood at the map estimate, and uh, thousands of people do that. Uh, but sometimes it gives you the wrong answers. Okay? If you want a quick answer, that's what you will do. You're not going to perform this integration because this integration can be painful, OK? Uh, but this, if without it, you're not Bayesian. And by the way, compare this uh, prediction distribution with the normalization factor uh, that we had in Bayes' rule. Remember in Bayes' rule, if I write the normalization factor for uh, the new observations x hat, that's the likelihood times the prior. So this is the prior. There is the posterior, OK? Prior and posterior. Now, um, 
how difficult it is to get this, right? And again, uh, in the derivation that you see here, please treat everything as all the symbols to be P, right? I wanted to, to use F for the uh, likelihood M for the normalization factor, but in your calculations, treat of this as probabilities. So look how easy is the derivation. Since your model is defined with parameters, so I bring the parameters in. Uh, so what rule of probability am I using here? How do we call that rule of probability on the first equation there? How? What? We, we, we integrate theta out. How do we call that? The sum rule of probability, right? The sum rule of probability. So basically, we went from uh, a distribution on x hat to a distribution of x hat and theta, but we integrate theta, all right? And uh, what do I do from here to there? What rule of probability we use? The product, OK? And then what I do is I divide and multiply by the probability, the joint probability of theta and x. And uh, uh, let's look first at this. This divided by uh, m of x, it gives me the posterior, right? Again, the product rule of probability. And this too, it gives me the posterior of x hat given theta and x. But you remember the likelihood. If I know theta, I don't need to know anything about x because theta defines my likelihood model. Okay? So the x dependence disappears, and there is the answer. Okay? So this is a nice uh, way to see uh, the predictive distribution as the integral in theta of uh, the likelihood times the posterior. Just remember, uh, you integrate in parameter space, not in data space. In parameter space. Let's do one example. A very simple example, because you have to do some of this in the homework as well. So let's uh, uh, take a Gaussian, OK? And um, uh, we're going to take that sigma square. The variance is known, and our only parameter is really the mean. And so what we're going to do, you know, before we define the MLD estimate, now we're going to put a prior on the, on the mean. And the prior is going to be another Gaussian that has uh, a mean mu 0 and a variance sigma, uh, sigma 0 squared. OK? So here, uh, I collect only one data point right, from this Gaussian, and I'm asking what is theta. OK? Or this can be a collection of data points. But basically, these are my data. OK? And I want to compute uh, the posterior of theta. Be very careful now with this calculation because it's uh, easy here, uh, but it's the same thing applied to any sort of problem. Okay? So, you, so we're going <coughs> to compute the posterior. And here I don't put the marginalization factor because the marginalization factor does not depend on theta. And I say the posterior is the likelihood times the prior. And the, uh, so this means it's proportional, right? Uh, we're interested to collect only the terms that depend on this parameter theta, all right? So the normalization factors in the likelihood, it doesn't depend on the mean, all right? So this is the only term that it counts, correct? So, uh, and indeed, I only have one data point, And the prior is another Gaussian, so the exponential here looks uh, e to the minus theta minus mu 0 squared over 2 sigma 0 squared. All right? So basically what I have done is, right, I plug in my, pri uh, my likelihood, I put the prior, but I only keep the terms that depend on the parameters theta, nothing else. Now, here is the trick. You want to figure out what type of distribution, you want to figure out what type of distribution you get. Because you know, leaving the result like that is not good enough. It's not appealing. Okay, so obviously, if you multiply two Gaussians, the chances that you will get a Gaussian are very good. So how are you going to get a Gaussian here? You remember a Gaussian needs to have uh, uh, has to be a Gaussian on what variable? What is our known variable here? We're trying to estimate theta. So we need a Gaussian in theta, which means the square exponential term should be e to the minus theta minus something squared divided by 2 times some variance term, correct? So we need to, to put the, all the terms 
these two terms together as one term that is theta minus something square. Okay? So if you expand those two terms and you rearrange, this is what you get. You get that these two terms together can be written as exponential of minus 1 over 2 sigma 1 square, theta minus mu 1 square, where what is uh, sigma 1 square? So 1 over sigma 1 square comes to be equal to 1 over sigma 0 square plus 1 over sigma square, and mu 1 is given by the equation you see on the bottom. Again, uh, what have I done? I expanded this, and then I put these things in a square form. This is what the statisticians say, call uh, closing the square, basically. Okay? So effectively, you know, there is a constant term that is missing here, right? But you remember, this is proportional to. So we only care about the terms in theta. So if you, divide, divide, uh, if you define this to be 1 over sigma 1 squared, and you define this to be uh, mu r to be sigma 1 squared times the, uh, this parenthesis, uh, you get basically the posterior being a Gaussian that has a mean mu 1 uh, and uh, a variance sigma 1 squared. And you see, interestingly enough, and you can generalize this thing uh, here, the precision of the posterior is the precision of the prior and the precision of in your likelihood model, right? This is the noise in the likelihood, if you like. So again, one over variance precision. So this is the prior precision, and um, uh, this is uh, the noise precision in your likelihood. And notice uh, again, uh, uh, you know, x one is your data, and mu zero is the mean from your prior model. Okay, so mu zero really plays uh, the role some dummy data point. And why this calculation is uh, important? Because you can imagine if you have very few points, if you have only x1, one data point like we have here, right? But x1 is not very good uh, data point, maybe it's corrupted. Because you have this uh, prior here, this will balance things and will give you a reasonable answer. Now, if you have lots of data points uh, and the calculations on the slides, the prior will play less and less uh, uh, important role. Uh, now I'm going to do a calculation uh, uh, the nasty way, and I know I changed the slide for those that uh, uh, printed this a few days ago. So somebody will say, okay, look, you started with one sample from the Gaussian and you gave me the posterior of the parameters. Now what I want to know is how the next sample from the Gaussian is going to look like. So I want to know what the predictive distribution, what's the you know, if you already have observed X1, how, what is the probability of future observations of X? So to do that, we're going to have to integrate the posterior times the likelihood in the parameter space. So this is the posterior. And again, I only indicate the terms that involve theta. Uh, this is the likelihood, all right? Uh, together, they look like that. Uh, if you open Wikipedia and you look at by variant Gaussians, you will find a very nice way, different formulas to perform this integration. I just wanted to only make it um, uh, very explicit on the slides, okay? So if you take this square, this quadratic term, you can actually, with some uh, imagination at work, as they say, you can write this as minus one half of this term times this matrix inverse times this vector which means immediately that this quadratic term there, e to the minus that, is really coming from a bivariate Gaussian with means mu1 and mu1, and covariance matrix this one. And again, I cook it up so it looks nice, right? Uh, if you uh, play around, right, you will come up with your own way of doing this, okay? You just need to trust me that this is really this. And you know, then I use a magic result. If you have a bivariate Gaussian and you, uh, and you marginalize, you integrate one variable out, uh, you know the marginal uh, distribution here is also Gaussian. And you will have, so in our case, we want to marginalize because we want to integrate theta out. 
So the only variable that is going to be left will be a variable in x. So looking at this, the marginal variable in x will be a Gaussian. What is the mean you think of the Gaussian going to be? Mu 1. And what is the variance of the Gaussian going to be? Sigma 1 squared plus sigma squared. OK? So basically, the predictive distribution for this problem, it's a Gaussian that has a mean mu 1 and a variance sigma 1 squared plus sigma squared. This is algebra, all right? This is the important formula. We collected only one data point. We computed the posterior. And now we actually know, if you already have an observation of x1, we know what the future observations will look like. That's an amazing result. We're way past the original Gaussian model that was based on the likelihood. Now we have a predictive distribution. Because when we had the likelihood, we did not account for any prior modeling of the parameters. This accounts for the prior knowledge, but also accounts for the fact that we already have seen some realization of that random variable. And so the new distribution is uh, a posterior predictive distribution that looks like this nice expression. OK? You may ask now, uh, since we have four minutes, can you actually ex uh, extend this uh, to uh, many data points? So if uh, um, sigma square again is uh, g uh, given, you collect n data points, and you put a prior on mu. Uh, so uh, everything is literally algebra. And I think this is part of the homework problem. So the likelihood will have uh, this summation here, this. Uh, uh, 2 pi sigma squared in the normalization, uh, we have an n over 2, OK? Uh, we don't really need actually this, OK? Forget it. Uh, so the posterior of the parameter mu will be this exponential. And then from uh, the prior, will look like that. And then we have to close the square. You remember, we have to put everything as a quadratic function in mu. So you can see here there's a mu squared, there's mu. What you're missing is a constant term, which doesn't matter really. So if you look at this carefully, uh, you immediately can put it in this form, and there's the answer. So the posterior is a Gaussian. Uh, the posterior precision is the precision of the prior. And n, over the pre n times the precision of, uh, in, uh, in your likelihood, so that's the noise precision. And you notice there is one contribution to the precision here for each data point. OK? And in many ways, you can interpret this as another data point, right, with uh, precision 1 over sigma 0 squared. OK? And uh, the mean uh, for uh, the posterior comes to actually be uh, a weighted mean of the maximum likelihood estimate. All right? Uh, how does the maximum likelihood estimate come? Well, you know, uh, there is a summation term that comes there. And you know that summation term is n times the maximum likelihood estimate of mu. So I, I just denote that the maximum likelihood estimate times n. And so it's a weighted average between the prior mean and the MLE estimate. And if you look very carefully at these formulas, you can recover uh, uh, all standard results, basically, by playing around. So for example, what do you expect to happen if you have infinite data? So if n goes to infinity, what is the effect of the prior? So if you have uh, n goes to infinity, uh, what is, you know, look at this formula here. If n goes to infinity, OK, uh, uh, what is the, uh, you know, or you can look here. You know, if n goes to infinity, what happens? What's the uh, mean that you get? If n goes to infinity, this term goes to 0. We agree? So if this goes to infinity, to infinity this goes to 1. So the, uh, the mean of the posterior is actually your MLE estimate. OK? Uh, now, uh, what happens if n goes to infinity here? Zero. Goes to 0. OK? And uh, um, and, and let me do the other extreme. Let's take a very uninformative prior now. So you remember the prior was a Gaussian, looking like that, right? Let's say you knew nothing about this Gaussian, and you make it a Gaussian you know, that has a sigma 0 squared that is very broad. 
All right, so sigma zero squared goes to infinity. What do you expect in the answers before we look at them? So if the uncertainty in the prior goes to infinity, you have no knowledge. So uh, first, let's, uh, yeah, so, you know, let's look here. If sigma zero goes to infinity, this goes to zero. So sigma n squared becomes sigma squared over n. Remember the answer, sigma squared over n. We have seen that somewhere. Okay, and look at the mean now. If sigma zero uh, squared goes to infinity, uh, what happens to this term? Goes to zero. And sigma zero squared goes to infinity, what happens to this term? Goes to the MLE estimate. Mm -hmm. So when the variance of the prior goes to infinity, the posterior mean becomes the MLE estimate, and the variance becomes sigma squared over n. Does that remind you the central limit theorem? OK? And you may try to connect the two things, but really there are two different settings. Because one comes from the Bayesian world, the other one is more fundamental in probability theory, right? But you can see on this little result on, uh, uh, you know. All right, so uh, there's many more examples that we need to do, including the multivariate case. So we will continue on, uh, uh, on Thursday. So please keep reading the slides, because the homework depends on uh, you understanding what's going on in the slides.